myself. I could keep you here for two and a half hours, maybe past <laughs> lunch. So bear with me even out through the weeds. For those of you that I have not had the pleasure of meeting, my name is Mark Brown. I'm here with my wife, Joni. She's somewhere here in the crowd. And we're from Brown's Auto Salvage in Bomazine, Vermont. Bomazine is a very small town, about 3,000 people. And that's really typical in our state. Vermont is made up of very small communities, all about 10 or 15 miles apart. Very rural, but very beautiful. <clears throat> I'm a first generation auto recycler. I started my company in 1976. And auto recycling came pretty naturally to me. As a youngster, I used to buy, rebuild, and sell bicycles and bicycle parts. And by junior high, that had transitioned to a long line of wretched backyard hot rods. I used to go to a salvage yard in a neighboring community before I was old enough to drive and buy small block Chevy motors out of the junk pile for 10 bucks a piece. My father would bring those home and I could usually make one out of three or four. The objective was always to rebuild a 327 with a 283 crankshaft that would de-stroke it to a 302 like the early Z28s and those things would rev to the moon. Typically, I'd put those in a mid-60 Chevy 2 Nova that came with a four or six cylinder, and they would be wicked fast. Probably not a one of the six or seven I built was fit for a public highway, but safety just wasn't the objective in those days. <laughs> my senior year of high school, I was applying to the US Coast Guard Academy when my father became very ill, and I elected to stay home for a couple years while he recuperated and I decided I would spend that time selling used auto parts. So I applied for a permit to open a salvage yard in my hometown of Pulteney, Vermont. Unfortunately, the neighboring landowners weren't too excited about that, and after a few months and some very contentious zoning hearings, my permit was denied. The very next night, I was at one of my part-time jobs pumping gas at a local service station, and a businessman from the next town stopped in to see me, he owned several small businesses, including the salvage yard that I used to frequent. He told me that he had heard of my failed zoning attempt and that he would sell me his salvage yard for $50,000. I told him I thought that was a good deal, but I didn't have that kind of money. He said, I know your boss here at the station and he tells me you work hard and you save all your money. How much do you have? And I said, 50,000 this paycheck. He goes, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to go into business for yourself. You give me your 5,000 as a down payment and I'm gonna finance the rest of it. Wow. And that's exactly what I did. So three weeks later, on August 1st of 1976, three days after my 18th birthday, I was a proud business owner and I was on top of the world. 30 days later, my father passed away and my world collapsed. I should have seen it coming, but I just didn't. At 18, I was nowhere near mature enough to be on my own. I guess most people aren't. Most people don't make good decisions at that age. And my decisions were probably worse than anybody here. Mine alternated between really bad and self-destructive. But I had to go to work. I had a mortgage to pay. I just bought the salvage yard. 
I had about 300 streetcars. In those days, we bought streetcars for $25. I sold streetcar parts and all the related headaches with that. I had a 20 by 40 pole barn with no plumbing and no insulation, and I did repairs. I know now it was my own fault, but it seemed that no matter how hard I worked, and I worked really hard seven days a week, I could never get ahead. It was always one step forward, two steps back. Getting bad checks, writing bad checks, having my electricity turned off by the power company. Every day felt like a punch in the face. And that's pretty much how I lived my life for the next few years. One day I finished work, I went home, got cleaned up, and I went out to a nice little local place to get a beer. And while I was standing there, talking with a friend of mine, the sun was going down and a beam of sunlight came in the window and it went across the floor and it seemed to attach itself to the most beautiful girl I had ever seen. And it held her like a princess in this globe of light. I was totally dumbstruck. I had never seen anything like this. And as the light came, it seemed to guide her right across the floor towards me. Well, my mouth went dry, my knees were knocking, I thought my heart was gonna blow right out of my chest. But I knew in that instant that my life would never be the same, and thank goodness it wasn't, and that's how I met Joni. I had been living my life in a series of angry fragments, and she put those pieces all back together. So we really hit it off, and six months later, we got married. Six years later, we had two kids, a son and a daughter, and last summer we celebrated our 40th wedding anniversary and our 40th anniversary of being business partners. We've worked together every day since then. The first year that we were married, Joni was finishing her senior year in college, but every minute that she wasn't in class or studying, we worked together. She did bookkeeping, something I had never done. She answered the phone. We traded her beautiful Olds 442 for a pickup truck and she delivered parts in the afternoon. We picked up cars together at night. She even helped me pull parts in the yard. In those days, we used to sell a lot of windshields and we would saw them out with a piece of piano wire. It was a hard job and it took two people. And she would help me do that in the summer when it was 90 degrees and in the winter time when it was 10 below. Joni and I had this dream that we could turn the salvage yard into a modern auto recycling center, even though we really had no idea what that looked like because we had never seen one. There were no progressive recyclers in our area, and this was before the internet. You couldn't go online and see pictures of what other people were doing for racking or dismantling procedures. You couldn't go on a, an internet forum and ask questions and get answers from recyclers all over the country. Everything was trial and error. And boy, we had a lot of trials and a lot of errors. But we were moving in a good direction. I feel like we were two steps forward, one step back. And then we joined the ARA, and that was a really smart thing to do. The ARA magazine, I think, was quarterly back then. We got to see what some of you, probably what some of your parents were doing. Um, we got to learn about progressive new products like the AIM inventory card system before computerization. For each piece of inventory, you had to fill out a three by five index card with all the information on that particular part. Very, very time consuming compared to what we have today with computerized inventory. Because we were ARA members, one day I got a card in the mail inviting us to a recycler show in New York State. Joni and I had never heard of anything like that. It was a small regional meeting and there were about 15 people there. And we met some really amazing folks. We met people that had been in this industry for decades. They were really smart. They were really progressive and they were really, really successful. But the amazing thing about these folks was they shared all of their ideas with us. They invited us on tours of their facilities. They told us things that had not worked well for them. They told us things that had helped them to be really <coughs> successful. They gave us the tools and the opportunity to be successful beyond our wildest dreams. 
And that's what I love so much about this industry, that recyclers care about each other and they help each other to grow and be more successful. People helping people in a way that everyone's life improves. And that brings me to the three things that I really want to talk about today, which are auto recycling, because that's why we're all here. And I want to talk a little bit about family business, because I believe that it's the family values that have created that earn and learn atmosphere that we have in this industry. And I want to talk a little bit about the United States of America, because like most of you, she's my country. I love her. She is a land of liberty, and liberty leads to opportunity. So a while ago, I was reading an article in the Wall Street Journal, and it made me think about you guys, the people that I would meet here today. This article was about government, and it was about family-owned, independent small business. Now, family-owned and independent are pretty self-explanatory. For this article, small business was defined as 500 or fewer employees. And I'm wondering today if I could see a show of hands, how many of you work for, represent, or own a family-owned, independent small business? That's awesome. I think that you and I are going to get along pretty well. I don't want to get too political today, and I don't know how it works in your state, but back home, it seems that we frequently elect people to represent us in Washington, D.C., based on the things that they tell us they're going to do for our country and our state, and we pay them $174,000 a year, plus benefits. Pretty good paycheck, right? That's what all U.S. Senators and Congressmen make. And for that, we expect that they're going to <clears throat> conduct the business of our country in a, in a professional way, and that they'll do some good things for our state, for our communities, like improve the infrastructure, pave the roads, fund our education and our police departments. But it seems that once they get to Washington, they get sidetracked by special interests, and it becomes self-interest I think they see dollar signs and, and pretty soon they forget about doing the right thing for the United States of America and they forget about doing the right thing for the citizens of America. Have any of you ever felt that way? Well, according to this article that I read recently, last year, while our elected officials in Washington were talking about the economy, you folks that had your hands up a few minutes ago were doing something about it you contributed 42% to the gross domestic product of the United States. Let that sink in. Family-owned, independent small business contributed 42% of all the money made in the United States of America last year. That's $12.5 trillion, and that's doing something about the American economy. And while the House of Representatives was talking about jobs, you same folks employed 46% of the American workforce. 61 and a half million people. And the majority of those people work for companies that employ fewer than 100. And when interviewed about why they work for small business, the most common answer was because they feel valued as people and their ideas and contributions are treated as important. And last year, while the Senate was talking about job growth, well, over the past 20 years, family-owned independent small business has created 12 and a half million new jobs, 200% more than public corporations and private equity. And do you know what all those employees of small business did? Well, a lot of them went out and bought houses and started paying local taxes. And those local taxes funded our infrastructure, paved our roads, funded our police departments, our education systems, our fire departments, and ambulance services. It funded our libraries and essential human health services. Many of our employees got married and started families. They became involved in our local schools. They became coaches and mentors and tutors. Many of them joined the parent-teacher associations and worked side-by-side -side with America's teachers to make sure that we provide the best possible education for our youngest citizens. 
Many of them became involved in local recreation and sports like Little League Baseball and Youth Hockey, Adult Softball, Volleyball and Basketball, Golf Leagues and Bowling Leagues. They worked out in our local gyms and yoga studios. They worshipped in our local churches. They joined local service clubs. They participated in our 4th of July parades and our Christmas celebrations. They shopped at local stores, and they celebrated important life events at local restaurants. In other words, they built community. Small business knows that when people have good jobs in positive environments, when they're treated with dignity and respect, when their ideas and contributions are celebrated, and when they're well compensated, they become happy and motivated and they become good members of our community. The opposite of that is social degradation that we have seen so much of across our country. And that's not all small business does for our communities. Within our communities, the majority of seats on local boards and commissions are held by small business owners. Select boards, school boards, zoning boards, recreation commissions, economic development commissions, library trustees, and church trustees. The majority of these positions are held by small business owners because small business owners want to build robust communities where families can live and work and play and thrive and feel safe. And small business keeps the profits in the community. Small business owners buy vehicles and equipment and supplies from other small business owners. They hire local professionals like attorneys, accountants, and financial services professionals to manage their employee benefit programs. They buy from local stores and they eat, eat in local restaurants. Small business owners understand cash flow and they know that communities need cash flow to be vibrant places to live. And small business puts its money where its mouth is. <clears throat> Last year, you folks donated almost $100 billion to charities and nonprofits within our communities. 250%, about 6% of profits, 250% greater than the percentage that public corporations donate to charities and nonprofits. Small business knows that tomorrow's leaders are today's youth, and you donated billions to help them make that transition. You donated to youth sports, youth academics, vocational education, and to scholarship programs like the one that is managed by the ARA. And small business knows that no American child should go to school hungry and without their necessary supplies. You donated to school lunch programs and backpack programs. And small business doesn't forget the generation that we inherited America from. You donated billions to senior citizen centers, Meals on Wheels, and to organizations that give our seniors rides to medical and other important events. You donated to first responders, to our police departments, our fire departments, and our ambulance services so they can serve our communities in times of need. You donated to churches and other religious organizations, and small business doesn't forget the disenfranchised in our communities. You donated billions to food shelves, homeless centers, and to facilities who are caring for our brothers and sisters who are struggling with addiction. And small business never forgets the men and women who have worn the uniform of the United States of America. You donated billions to veterans causes like the VA, wounded warriors, honor flights, and to organizations that are helping to stem the American tragedy of veteran suicide. In our country, we celebrate our American veterans, and it is altogether fitting that we do because our liberty was won on the battlefield in the American Revolution. 
And since that time, our servicemen and women have defended liberty during peacetime and war at home and around the globe. But it is America's small business people who took that liberty and built America and continue to build America today. Small business is the backbone of America and the lifeblood of America. And small business makes life in American communities great every day. But it can turn around and go the other way. And I've seen it happen right in my own community. Back in the 1970s, about the same time that I started in business, a couple of fellows moved to a neighboring community and started a business in a barn that belonged to the, one of their grandfathers. They built wrought iron lamps and chandeliers, and they were really good at it. In four or five years, they had about a dozen people working there. Another four or five years goes by, and they announced they're putting a big addition on the barn, and they're going to hire 20 more people. These guys were super smart. They were friends of mine. They needed a freight elevator in this addition. It was going to cost about 200000 and then they realized they didn't have the three-phase power to do it. They bought an old electric forklift, they took the mask off it, poured it into a concrete footer, converted the electric hydraulics to 110 and built a freight elevator for five grand. Super smart guys. Well, they continued on this meteoric growth. About 10 years goes by and they announced that they're looking for a new home. They're going to build a ground up factory complex and they're gonna hire 200 additional employees. Well, all the local towns went crazy for this, mine included. We offered them a piece of land, some infrastructure upgrades, tax stabilization. We offered to go wash their cars every night. Well, we got the deal. So they came to our town and they built a couple of really big steel buildings. They hired local contractors to do it. They hired local contractors for the plumbing, the electrical, the paving. All the local contractors had work. It was tremendous. And then they set out to hire these 200 employees. Well, they needed unskilled labor, semi-skilled. They needed a lot of highly skilled people. They needed graphic artists, graphic designers, photographers, uh, marketing people, HR people, managers on all levels. So they hired a lot of local folks, but they were paying top salaries and they hired a lot of people from out of our area people that were really well educated and had a lot of business experience. And this was great for the community. These folks moved to town, they built new houses, they bought old houses and renovated them. Many of them had children that they enrolled in our school system. Many were very civic minded and they participated in school activities. They joined local service clubs. They spent a lot of money in the community. It was wonderful. And the business itself turned out to be the best possible community partner. They were very, very progressive. They hired a lot of young interns from our high school and local college, gave them valuable experience and paid them top dollar. Uh, the business partnered with every organization in town. If the Little League team needed uniforms, done. If the Rotary Club had a fundraiser, they donated thousands of dollars worth of products. They partnered with church groups, school groups, the Women's Club, the Historical Society, everybody. This was truly the greatest thing that had ever happened to our small community. <clears throat> well, it went on like this for several years. They had tremendous growth, a few bumps in the road, you know, trying to finance that, that really fast growth. But it was just wonderful. So about 10 years later, the two founders of the company announced that they had had enough and they wanted to retire. And they deserved it, they worked really hard. And they announced that they had sold their company to a financial services firm. Well, everyone in town was excited about this because we had this fast growing manufacturer and now they were going to be owned by a larger company that had the financial resources to continue this growth through the next decade. But that's not what happened. Right after the sale, this company discontinued using the local attorney and accountant. 
and very quickly it became obvious they were no longer going to practice community philanthropy on the level they had. No longer would they be pouring tens of thousands of dollars every year into local charities and nonprofits. And then the layoffs started. And by the time they were done, 20% of the employees at that company had lost their jobs. Overwhelmingly, the higher paid people. I had become friends with one of them, and I asked him, what's going on over there? He said, I have no idea. My job was eliminated, and I was told, the phrase he used was, to improve operational efficiencies. Now this fellow actually had a different phrase that he used to describe it, but I'm not gonna use that one today. <laughs> anyway, this was really hard on those folks because so many of them had moved to our town, bought homes, enrolled their kids in school, and now their jobs were gone, and they were high paying, specialized positions that were not easily replaced in our rural area. Many of them had to sell their homes, take their kids out of school, and move away. Well, as you can imagine, it was the talk of the town. Our local town fathers proposed a meeting to meet with the new management team of this company and find out what their business plan was. But the management team said they would not participate. Everywhere you went, it's all we talked about. Why would this financial services firm buy a very successful manufacturer and immediately start downsizing? So I had an idea, I had a friend who was an investment maker in New Hampshire, and he had been involved in some big deals. So I called him up and said, Scott, let me tell you the story of this company, and you tell me what's going on. He said, wait a minute, I'm not the guy for that, but I have a close friend who is. He actually lives in Vermont, and he's involved in the company that you're talking about. Let me see if I can get him on the phone. So he did, and he made the introductions, and I got to pose the question to him, why would you buy this fast-growing manufacturer and immediately start downsizing it? And he said, we're not downsizing it. The problem is, you're an entrepreneur, and you small business guys think the only way to make money on a company is to grow it and hire more people. But there's other ways to make money when you buy a company. Have you heard of private equity? And I had to admit, I did not. I didn't know anything about it. He said, well, I'm in the private equity business, and we buy and sell companies like you might buy and sell a classic car. In a nutshell, this is what we do. He said, first, we do our due diligence. We look for a segment of the economy, a business or businesses, that we think we can buy for less than they're worth, improve their operational efficiencies, and sell them for more money. Now, once we've done our due diligence and we have determined the company or companies that we want to buy, we open up what we call a private equity fund. We want to raise money from investors to do this business deal. Let's say we need $100 million to do the deal. We don't want to use all our own money. We want to spread the risk. So we open the private equity fund, and typically it has a 10-year lifespan. So our investors will know they won't get their money back for 10 years. And when they do, they'll get their money and a percentage of the profits, or they'll take a percentage of the loss. And the minimum investment in a typical private equity fund is $250,000 although sometimes it's as much as 25 million. And the Securities and Exchange Commission prohibits us from soliciting investments from ordinary investors like you. So we solicit investments from institutional investors like insurance companies and pension funds. And we solicit investments from sovereign wealth funds. A sovereign wealth fund is an investment arm of a country. You've probably heard of the Saudi Arabia Sovereign Wealth Fund. They have about $900 billion. They invest it in companies all over the world, everything from golf to casinos. And we solicit investments from what the Securities and Exchange Commission calls qualified high net worth individuals, which is just a term for really rich people. And we solicit investments from these rich people all over the United States 
all over the world. We have investors from Moscow, from Beijing, from the Middle East, from Singapore, all over. And then once we raise our target amount, we close the fund and we go out and buy the company or companies. He said to me, you may remember a decade and a half ago, my firm bought Green Mountain Coffee Roasters in Montpelier, Vermont. That was a company that had bloated management. They had a very progressive liaison-faire style, and they had a proprietary product that we didn't think they were marketing well. We bought that company with $30 million of private equity money, grew it, and eight years later, we sold it for $300 million and all the profits were returned to those investors all over the world. Now the lamp company in your town is never gonna be big enough to go public. So what we're going to do is improve their balance sheet so it looks more profitable than it does today and we'll sell it to someone else. And to do that, we'll improve the operational efficiencies. We'll lay off as many people as we possibly can. And if there's any hard assets on the balance sheet that we can sell and turn into cash, we're gonna do that too. If there's a company airplane, a company retreat on a lake, any of those sacred cows the past owners liked, they're gone. And if there's any equipment that we can sell and turn into cash and lease back, we'll do that too. And we may acquire a substantial amount of debt. But when we have the balance sheet, looking more profitable than it does today, we'll sell it to someone else. And that is exactly what happened. Seven or eight years later, this land company in my town was sold to another private equity firm, and all the profits that used to go into my community were returned to those investors wherever they were all over the world. Now, it probably sounds like I'm bashing that company, and I'm not. They're still in my community, and they're still good for our town. They still employ, I don't really know, over 100 people. But they're not the good jobs that they used to be. They're not the high-paying jobs that they used to be. And they don't hire young interns from our local schools, give them valuable business experience, pay them top wages, and give them the opportunity to advance up through the company. And they no longer pump tens of thousands of dollars into our local economy through charities and nonprofits. A few years ago, I was at a social function, and I ran into one of the founders of that company. I hadn't seen him in a decade. In our conversation, he expressed his dismay at the direction that his former company had gone. He told me that he thought that the company that he started would always be a progressive company that paid top wages, a progressive company that hired young interns, paid them top wages, and advanced them up through the company. He thought that his company would always be philanthropic, and that the profits would always be put into the local economy. He told me that he was embarrassed that so many people that he had hired and convinced to move from other states ended up losing their jobs, having to sell their homes, and move away. And I said, well, surely you don't think that the local people hold that against you, do you? And he said, no, you're missing the point. It's my legacy that breaks my heart. I thought I would have a legacy of being someone that created the best company in town. A legacy of providing high quality employment. A legacy of putting hundreds of thousands of dollars back into the community. A legacy of running a great company. And that's not what my legacy is today. Well, that really made me think because this was a few years ago. I was in my early 60s, and Joni and I were starting to think about retiring and selling our business. And we had never thought, what would our legacy be? I knew I didn't want it to be what his was. We have dozens of employees who have worked with us for decades. 
they have worked side by side with Joni and I to build our company into what it is today. What would happen to them when we sold our company? Our son has a degree in economics and he works in the family business. What would happen to him? Would his job be eliminated due to improving operational efficiencies? What about our customers and our suppliers and what about our community? Our community has partnered with us for 40 years to help us grow and we partnered with them to put as many profits as we could back into the community. Well, Joni and I talked about this a lot and we decided that the best thing for us to do for our retirement is to give our company to our son and in exchange, he gave us a contract to be consultants for 20 years for about what a congressman makes. We talked about that, that's a pretty good paycheck. We don't need a check for millions of dollars. We just wanna be able to live a nice life. Well, that turned out to be the perfect arrangement for all the stakeholders in our company. It was a win-win for Joni and I because we got the financial security that we wanted in retirement and allowed us to do what we thought was the ethical thing with our company. It was a win for our employees because they got to keep the security of the jobs that they have dedicated their lives to. It was a win for our son because he gets to build his American dream of providing high quality local employment. It was a win for our customers and a win for our suppliers. And it was a win for our community because our business profits will continue to go back into the community. And because since we did this and our company is now run by our son, a younger, more aggressive person, he has grown the payroll from around 40 to around 60. And do you know what those new employees did? You do know, because we've already talked about this. A lot of them bought homes in the community and have started paying local taxes. Some of them started families and have become more involved in our local school system. One of them serves the community as a volunteer fireman, and one of them serves the community by going to a facility that is transitioning men from incarceration back to the community. He and his wife go there on Saturday nights cook dinner for these men and counsel them on how to reintegrate into the community as good citizens. Now, I know that our arrangement isn't terribly unique. I know that many of you here are second, third, and even fourth generation recyclers. Are there any fifth generation? I know there's some at, at the meeting this weekend. You obviously understand the value of keeping a company in the family, keeping local control, and keeping the profits in your community. Back home in our PRP Northeast group, almost everyone is in that situation. Bow Auto Parts in New Hampshire, second generation. In Connecticut, Bishops and Dames are second generation. Goyettes in Massachusetts, <clears throat> soon transitioning to third generation. ELM in New Jersey, second. The Carmen family in North Jersey at Lantini Auto Salvage, they just opened a second facility and they're transitioning to the fourth generation. Keeping alive the legacy of high quality local employment and profits going back into the community. Tolpa's Auto Parts, soon to be second. At Wilbert's Auto Parts in New York State, the company was founded by Art Wilbert, passed to his three sons, They've continued rapid expansion, and they need to because the third generation has 12? 11. 11. A legacy, they're continuing Art Wilbert's legacy of high quality employment and keeping the profits in the local economy. At Chuck's Auto Parts in Pennsylvania, they have two facilities founded by Charles Reinhardt I, passed to his two sons, one ready to retire, one not yet. 
They hired Urban Associates, a succession planner from Texas. I think many of you are familiar with them. I have contact information for them if anyone is interested. The Reinhardt family worked with Urban Associates over a couple of years to determine the needs of all the stakeholders in the extended family. They developed a personalized plan of succession to meet the needs of that family and that company to keep the business in the family and the profits in the community. Same with my friends Brad and Mark Rose. I'm sorry. <clears throat> I know not all of you have a son or a daughter that wants to be in the recycling industry. That was the situation that my friend Paul Zanini was in. Paul owned Alliance Auto Parts in New York City. He identified a key employee, Sal and Guardia, and made him a minor partner. Paul worked with Sal, and when they were both ready, Paul sold the company to Sal and Guardia and financed the entire thing. That was 20 years ago. Today, Sal and Guardia runs Alliance Auto Parts with his three sons and many other family members. Paul is 85 years old, a wonderful human being, very healthy, very sharp. He stops in every week proud of what the Engardia family has done to grow Alliance Auto Parts and proud of his legacy of keeping that company family owned. The same thing for my friends Brad and Mark Rose. They identified a key employee, Jason Dorn. He doesn't need any introduction. One of the smartest young operators in the business. Made Jason a partner. He's managing the company, keeping the legacy of Morris Rose alive in Kalamazoo. Now, I'm not a succession planner. I'm not a retirement planner. I never did make it to college. I'm just a hillbilly from Vermont. And I may not be a smart guy, but I'll tell you one thing I do know with all my heart. These companies that you folks have built are bigger than you are. They are American treasures, and they have outsized importance to the people that work there and to the communities that host them. When you were building your company, you had to work really hard and use creative thinking to solve complex problems. And when it comes time to transition the ownership, you're going to have to work hard and use creative thinking to solve complex problems if you want your family company to remain an American treasure. In my lifetime, and many of you will remember this, every community had a locally owned hardware store and a locally owned pharmacy a locally owned radio and television store. And all of those stores hired local people and they gave them the opportunity for advancement. In many cases, when the owner retired, one of those employees had the opportunity to buy the company. And all the profits stayed in the community. Today, all of those stores have been reduced to an aisle at the Walmart store that they built out on the edge of town by the interstate. None of the profits stay in the community. They all go back to the home office. The jobs are entry level with little or no chance for advancement. We keep saying we want to build a better America, but we have cut her wrists and we're selling her blood by the court and all the related opportunity to wealthy investors, many of whom who live in countries that have hostile relationships with the United States of America. You guys from the Southwest know what I'm talking about. In the last 10 years, a million acres of prime agricultural land, and in some cases the water rights associated with it, have been sold to private equity firms controlled by Saudi Arabia and China, and that's not better. I see all these political signs that say, make America great again. Do, does anybody really believe that a politician of any party is gonna do that for us? I do not. I think that's a job that you and I are gonna need to do together. 
And we should want to do it together because this is a great country. And it was given to us in trust by our forefathers and foremothers. And to be perfectly honest with you, I don't think they'd be that pleased with some of the stuff that we're letting go on today. I'd like to see political signs that said, let's work together to build better outcomes for America, for American communities, because that's something that we could all work on together. As small business owners, we've been working on it, but as one American to another, I'm telling you what you already know, we need better outcomes. We're gonna need to do more for our country. In his inaugural address, the late American President John Fitzgerald Kennedy challenged Americans when he said, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Well, when one of us does something good for our country, for our community, it's like a drop of water that lands in the ocean. It makes a positive ripple. But when we all do it at the same time, those ripples will form a tidal wave of positive energy that will wash across this country and in its wake will be opportunity, security, and success like we have never seen. Success is a funny word, isn't it? We all define it differently. For some folks, success could only be defined as having the biggest mansion, or a super yacht, or some silly outfit because it costs tens of thousands of dollars. For my great-grandfather, success was defined as one step. It was the step that he took from the boat to the shores of Ellis Island in New York City. After years of hardship and struggle, he had arrived at the land of opportunity, the United States of America. He was prepared for a life of hard work. He just needed someone to give him an opportunity. And someone did give him an opportunity, a small business owner just like you guys. This man owned a three-person machine shop in present-day Harlem. He gave my great-grandfather a job. He taught him skills. He took the time to teach him how to be a good American citizen. He taught him how to be a good provider for a family, and he taught him how to save money for the future. That man worked side-by-side side with my great-grandfather for 10 years. And then that man helped my great-grandfather start his own small business, a repair shop with an apartment above it for his family. I believe that today many Americans would describe success as having a job with security, a home, and a family. They just need someone to give them that opportunity and to teach them how to be a good American citizen to teach them how to be a good provider for their family and to teach them how to save money for the future. I read once that true success is what happens when all the people that you want to love you do love you. And I hope all of you find that success. Joni and I would like to wish all of you the blessing of excellent health and happiness. Thanks so much for listening this morning. It means the world to me. God bless each and every one of you, and God bless the United States of America.